Greetings again to our Reba Church community and to the wider Emmanuel Approach community. We love you. We miss you. During this time of COVID-19 social distancing and sheltering in place, we especially miss your smiles and your hugs. Welcome back for another teaching segment about the Emmanuel Approach. So in the previous teaching segments, I talked about the Emmanuel truth that God is always with us. I talked about relational circuits, how we have circuits in our brains that serve as the neurological hardware for running relationships, and how we can connect with each other and with God much more easily when these relational circuits are online and strongly active. I talked about how we can predictably, reliably, consistently get these relational circuits online and strongly active by recalling and connecting with positive memories and deliberately generating or stirring up deep gratitude. I talked about how we can establish a living, interactive connection with God by inviting God's presence into the positive memory, asking God to help us perceive His presence, and then noticing whatever comes into our awareness. I talked about how our relationships are memory mapped, how our relationships are carried in memories. I talked about how reconnecting with the memory recreates, at least to some extent, the same mind-brain conditions that were present at the time of the original experience. And I talked about how using positive memories that include an experience of God's presence takes advantage of these two pieces of brain science. I talked about how our brains are designed to work best in community, how describing our internal mental content out loud to another person helps us to feel its importance and to recognize its meaning. And I talked about how including this piece in our Emmanuel prayer will enable us to perceive subtle manifestations of the Lord's presence that we might otherwise miss and enable us to recognize and receive subtle interactive content from the Lord that we might otherwise miss. I talked about and demonstrated several different options for receiving help from God. We can receive God's comfort and peace by talking directly to God about our distress and then experiencing the truth that God is with us in our distress, that God is hearing us and understanding us, that God cares about us, and that God is glad to be with us. We can receive God's help by talking directly to God about our distress and then asking, what do you want me to know about this, Lord? And we can receive help from God by connecting with God and then just spending restoration time with Him as respite and refuge. And I talked about Emmanuel approach troubleshooting. I talked about how God is always with us, how God always wants to connect with us, how if this doesn't happen initially, then there's just something in the way, and how when we find and resolve the blockages, we will perceive God, and we will experience a mutually interactive, contingent connection with God's tangible, personal, living, loving presence. Now, this week, I'm going to talk about Emmanuel Approach safety nets. Prior to developing the Emmanuel Approach, Charlotte and I had decided to avoid emotional healing group exercises due to concerns about the possibility that many people might get stuck at the same time. With all of the approaches to emotional healing that we were aware of, trouble re troubleshooting required quite a bit of knowledge and skill and could only be provided in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Therefore, we never did group exercises because we did not want to get to the end of an exercise and have 38 people stuck in traumatic memories with each person needing an experienced facilitator to provide one-on-one -on -one troubleshooting. Actually, I did lead an emotional healing group exercise. Once. I tried a group exercise at one of our Theophosic seminars with maybe 50 to 75 people. Many of the participants experienced powerful healing, but a number of the other participants got stuck in traumatic memories. We were not able to provide one-on-one -on -one troubleshooting in the group context, and these people had miserable experiences. Once was definitely enough. Hence our decision to avoid emotional healing exercises with groups. Prior to developing the Emmanuel approach, we were also cautious about lay people doing emotional healing work. We wanted them to get a lot of training before facilitating lay ministry, and we felt that beginners should only practice under the close supervision of experienced facilitators. Just as with group exercises, we were concerned that recipients might get stuck. We were concerned that some recipients would open up painful memories, encounter difficulties beyond the troubleshooting abilities of lay ministers and especially beginners, and then be re-traumatized by remaining stuck in toxic trauma content. The really good news is that the Emmanuel approach includes safety nets that address these concerns about group exercises, lay ministers, and beginners. Emmanuel approach safety net number one. 
The initial steps of recalling a positive memory, deliberately stirring up appreciation, and establishing an interactive connection with the Lord, all, com all combined to set up an especially reliable home base, an especially reliable home base that the facilitator can use as a backup troubleshooting resource, as a safety net troubleshooting resource. If the process encounters any difficulties that the, that the facilitator does not know how to handle, she can just coach the recipient to go back to the positive memory and interactive connection from the beginning of the session. And then in that safe, positive context, the facilitator can coach the recipient to engage directly with Jesus and ask him for guidance and help regarding the problem. Again, you can help the recipient get back to her home base and then coach her to get help directly from Jesus in that safe, positive context at any point you encounter difficulties that you don't know how to handle. This especially reliable home base that gets set up at the beginning of the session can also provide a make sure the person is okay safety net for the end of the session. If you are approaching the end of the session and the recipient is still connected to negative emotions from a traumatic memory, either because the process has gotten stuck and you have not yet resolved the blockage, or because there's just a lot of healing work to do and you simply don't have enough time, you can just coach the recipient to go back to the positive memory, appreciation, and connection with Lord and connection with the Lord that were refreshed and put in place at the beginning of the session. The recipient may be disappointed that she was not able to fully resolve the traumatic memory, but at least she ends up back in a safe place of relational connection and positive emotions. An airplane analogy is helpful for understanding the particular importance of the make sure the person is okay at the end of the session safety net. Having a safety net that enables a recipient to get back to her initial positive memory and connection with Jesus, even under difficult circumstances, such as getting stuck in the middle for healing work and then running out of time, is like having a safety net that would enable a pilot to always get her plane safely back on the ground, regardless of any problems she might encounter in the air. So let's think about this. The scariest thing about flying in an airplane is that if things go wrong, you can drop out of the sky at hundreds of miles per hour and end up as flaming debris scattered across somebody's cornfield. This is why you never hear of beginner pilots practicing without an experienced pilot sitting right next to them. Without one-on-one -on -one supervision, a beginner making even one serious mistake or encountering any serious problem she doesn't know how to handle would pretty much be dead. No sane person will take this kind of risk. In contrast to that scenario, think about how not scary and not dangerous flying would be if there were a big red button in the middle of the control panel that could always get you safely back on the ground. You've miscalculated the cost of fighting a strong headwind all the way from New York to Chicago, and now you're running out of fuel over the middle of Lake Michigan? No problem. Just push the big red button and you're perfectly safe back on the ground in New York. You can't see the ground because of heavy cloud cover, your navigational system gives out, and now you're totally lost somewhere over the Rocky Mountains between New York and Los Angeles? No problem. Just push the big red button and you're perfectly safe back on the ground in New York. You might be disappointed that you weren't able to get to Chicago or Los Angeles, but I think most people could handle the risks of learning to fly without one-on-one -on -one supervision if that was the worst that could happen. This is why it's safe to do group exercises. This is why it's safe for lay people to facilitate a manual approach sessions. And this is why it's safe, and this is why it's safe for beginners to practice without one-on-one -on -one supervision. We have a big red button. Emmanuel Approach Safety Net Number Two. When working with groups, when teaching the basic exercises to lay ministers, and especially when training beginners, we set a policy that establishes a second safety net. Those who are not able to perceive the Lord's presence and establish an interactive connection with Him at the beginning of the exercise are encouraged to participate in the rest of the exercise as facilitators or intercessors, but they do not work with their own traumatic memories. This precaution seems to identify and protect those who are most likely to get stuck and have negative experiences, thereby providing a second safety net. It also identifies those who, who do not have the first safety net, the primary safety net, in place, which is another really good reason for them to abstain from working on their own trauma. So I've just given you the seven-minute summary of the basic material regarding a manual approach safety nets. 
If you want a more thorough discussion of Emanuel Approach Safety Nets, with footnotes, more examples and stories, and also discussion of intermediate and advanced principles and techniques, I would encourage you to go to the Big Lion book. The whole of Chapter 14 is about the Emanuel Approach Safety Nets, and Chapter 24 includes even more information about the Emanuel Approach Safety Nets. Now I would like to talk about deploying the first safety net, the primary safety net, in the two scenarios that are both basic and the most common. In situations where the recipient has had adequate time to share her pain story, and she feels heard and understood by the facilitator, if the session seems to become stuck and they don't know what to do, the recipient will be more than willing to cooperate with the facilitator in deploying the troubleshooting safety net. She will be more than willing to let the facilitator help her get back to her positive memory and connection with Jesus from the beginning of the session, and then, in that safe, positive context, help her ask Jesus for guidance and help regarding whatever difficulties they have encountered. Similarly, in situations where the recipient has had adequate time to share her pain story, she feels heard and understood by the facilitator, and they've been rummaging around in traumatic memories without resolution, when they are approaching the end of the available time, the recipient will be more than willing to cooperate with the facilitator in deploying the end-of-session safety net. She will be more than willing to let the facilitator help her get back to her initial positive memory and connection with Jesus so that her plane will be safely back on the ground by the end of the session. So now we're going to show you what this looks like. What it looks like to deploy the primary safety net in the basic, most common end-of-session safety net scenario. To summarize very quickly, Charlotte will help me to set up my safety net home base by, help, by coaching me to recall a positive memory and focus on the details until I feel gratitude, by coaching me to invite God to be with me in the positive memory and to ask God to help me to perceive his presence, and by coaching me to describe everything that comes into my awareness. Once I have established a good connection with Jesus in the context of the positive memory, I will recall a traumatic memory and focus on the details until I feel the painful content from inside the trauma. And then, without doing any healing work to reduce or resolve my painful thoughts and emotions, Charlotte will coach me back to my initial positive memory and connection with Jesus to make sure that we, to make sure that we finish the session with my plane safely back on the ground. This will simulate a session in which the recipient is working on traumatic memories but is not able to resolve them by the end of the session, so that the facilitator has to use the end of session safety net to make sure that the recipient finishes the session back at a safe, positive place, to make sure that the recipient finishes the session with her plane safely back on the ground. Note again that we are simulating the easiest, and thankfully also the most common, end of session safety net scenario, where I have had adequate time to share my pain story, I have felt heard and understood, and I am glad to cooperate with deploying the safety net when Charlotte tells me that it's time to get the plane safely back on the ground. Note also that we will only be demonstrating the end of session safety net. The troubleshooting safety net would look very similar, but of course would be in the middle of the session instead of at the end. And instead of just getting the plane back on the ground and then closing the session, you would help the, re you would help the recipient get back to her initial positive memory and connection with Jesus. And then in that safe, comfortable context, you would coach her to ask Jesus for guidance and help regarding whatever difficulties had caused the session to become stuck. Finally, we are pretending that Charlotte is a participant in one of our basic training events. So most of what she says will be coming straight from the sample coaching words included in the handouts we use for our basic training exercises. For this exercise, uh, you want to choose a strong positive memory without any negative splinters. And a memory that includes a connection with God is ideal. Mm. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I have, a, I have a memory. Good, okay, so now I want you to close your eyes, if you want to, and imagine yourself uh, being back inside of the original experience, whatever that memory is, and describe it in as much detail as possible. So, for example, what did you see, hear, smell, taste, feel on your skin? What thoughts were you having at the time? What thoughts come as you think about it now? What emotions were you having at the time? What emotions come as you think about it now and how does your body feel even? And after you have described the memory, I want you to go back and focus especially on the best parts until you feel strong appreciation. So let's do that. Okay, so 
<clears throat> I'm going to use my canoeing in Minnesota, seeing the otters, and I'm going to include the Jesus piece this time. So I'm, we're all together. It's me and you. We're, we're with Dan and Emily. We're you can picture it. We're a windy, smooth, quiet, small river going through grass beds, little, little hummocks with rocks and trees on them in the distance. We're coming around a corner and um, in the distance I see this, it was like a big sort of a sea serpent. At first I was like, wow, that's, what, what on earth? And I got my binoculars and I'm like, oh, it's sea otters. There's a, there's a couple sea otters up there. Uh, not, uh, river otters. River otters. And, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's maybe June or something. Perfect, kind of cool weather. A little breeze. It's just bright and beautiful. Fresh air. It's nobody else around. It's just it's just the four of us out there. And we're we're getting closer. And the thought comes to me, like river otters are famously curious. I was thinking, I wonder if like. If we do something interesting, like what if we what if we sing? Like I wonder if they might get curious instead of just r instead of running away. Like whether they would actually let us get closer if they're curious. So I said, hey, this, look, I explained that, and we so we started singing, "Shine, Jesus, Shine," and it and it seemed to be working. Like for one, we were just getting closer and closer. Where they would like look, they were looking at us, and and when we came all the way up to them, they were like totally curious. They'd pop up on one side of our two boats and like six feet away, kind of looking looking around, and then they'd pop up right between our boats, maybe five feet from either of us. Practically could have reached out and touched them, and they're looking up at us, going, <laughs> little snuffly noises, and going in front of us and behind us, and on one side and the other side, and popping up in the middle. And we just paddle along quietly for maybe a quarter of a mile. They just stay with, they just followed us along, popping up and beside and beside in the middle and the front. It was it was so cool to be so close to them. You could see the little faces, hear the little hear their little snuffling noises. It was it was such a cool we were all just smiling. I remember we were all just like, wow, this is so cool. We're singing, we're kind of smiling at each other. We're all just like, wow, can you believe this is happening? Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I used this for a an Emmanuel prayer time, um, and welcome Jesus' presence, and I kind of felt like he was here, like he was here in the room, kind of remember, like when you're looking at a photo album together, and you're like, oh, wasn't that neat? And he was also like in the memory, I could have sort of a sense of his presence, an image of his face, and he was big grin, kind of like that. Um, he was just having fun watching us have such a good time together. It was, he kind of had that feeling of like when you when parents get their kids something really special for Christmas and they don't they they don't want the kids to open it before they wake up. They're like they the parents love watching the kids open the present about as much as the kids enjoy opening it, and the parents are just like oh they just it's he, he kind of has that feeling. He's just mm -hmm. like. So he is a, he's so having fun watching us enjoy hmm. the beautiful experience hmm. so I, and that okay, that's totally the best part of the memory but also just I, mean, I still picture the little faces <laughs> poking out of the water and, and they kind of come part, you know quite a bit they, they stick way out of the water when they're kind of their little long skinny necks and <laughs> looking at looking from one canoe to the other you know, was all, we were all smiling and just having a, it was just, it was all wonderful. I, mm. I can definitely feel gratitude. Mm. Well, okay, so now I want you to pray something like, Jesus, I welcome you to be with me in this memory. Help me to perceive your living presence. Help me to make the transition from remembering you with me to perceiving your presence as living and interactive. Yeah, Lord, I definitely welcome you to be with me in the memory. 
Thank you for being with me in the memory. I ask you to help me to perceive your living presence. I ask you to, to yeah, help me make that transition from remembering you with me to perceiving your presence as real and living and interactive right, right here, right now. And I, Just sort of feeling again. Um, and he's just enjoying being with us. That the memory is actually so vivid; it's almost hard to tell. It's like, but it feels like he's yeah that same feeling of he's enjoying. Like watching us enjoy his creation, kind of that feeling. He, he's watching us open his present. He's he's tickled, like um, um, he's pleased with himself for coming up with such a such a special. He's like he he correctly perceives that he's. Hit the bullseye with this, like the, the um, yeah. This is he. He can. He is enjoying his success mm -hmm. in how um, how beautiful this particular uh, whole experience was. Mm. Mm. It just feels fun. And it feels really special. Mm. And it sounds like maybe you're kind of already there, but as you're able to notice and describe everything that comes into your awareness, regardless of whether it feels important, makes sense, or is neatly packaged, and especially describing detail and your perception of Jesus' presence and any interactions oh, with Jesus. Right. I did. Sorry. I, I already did that. I jumped ahead of myself. Yeah, that's all. That's that's what's coming into my awareness. <sighs> yeah, thank you, Lord. Well, so I have my, as you can probably tell, I have my safety net home base set up there. I have a place where I can, where I'm recalling, remembering a positive memory. I'm feeling appreciation. I can, I have a connection with Jesus they've all uh, they've all just been refreshed and I can go back to them so I had that home base set up and now I'm going to uh, now I'm going to recall a traumatic memory and focus on the details until I can feel until I feel connected to the painful content from inside the trauma <clears throat> okay so So this is um, from medical school, um, probably the, not probably, the easily the hardest, most brutal rotation. I think it was the worst rotation in the whole in the whole program, the hematology oncology rotation. So that's the cancer unit. Um, and it was just uh, physically it was like the longest hours it was i actually figured it out i was working between we were working between 120 and 130 hours a week i think one week i counted 127 hours and if you do the math there's like almost no time to sleep and that it was uh, it was just physically it's just hard to even be awake that many hours a day i mean it was crawl out and drag yourself out of bed in the morning, work all day, work until bedtime, you know, get in bed as fast as you can, get up the next morning still tired and do it all over again. And then, you know, every four or five days, you wait, work all night on call. So you work all day and then you work all night and you work all the next day. And doing that like once, working all night for a college term paper is sort of a, 
you know, an exhausting experience, but it's sort of exciting to do it once. And maybe working a hundred hour week for the end of a campaign or some big project is sort of, it's somehow not quite as horrible to do it for one week. But I just did, did, did something to my soul to just work those insane hours just day after day after day. I you got I got so tired that I I couldn't feel I like I could barely feel care anymore. It's like I mm. I could barely even feel like I I just I was so tired that I hardly even cared anymore. And uh, so somewhere in the middle of that horrible rotation, um, this lady comes in and she you know, comes into the onto the floor, big hubbub, big all big of urgency. Her nurses wheel her bed in, or on a stretcher from the ER, and she had come into the ER just thinking she kind of felt like she had a flu but it wasn't going away and she was worried like is there something else going on you know maybe I have low thyroid or so she comes into the ER just to get you know to like hey just why don't you check to see if there's something else going on and they do the lab and she has leukemia and it's just it's in what's called blast crisis where the bone marrow is just spewing out huge amounts of white blood cells and her her white blood cell numbers were like None of us. We were like, how? How can? How is she not dead? I mean, it, it, her blood was so thick. We're like, any second she could have a fatal a stroke or a heart attack. So it's like big. Ah, it was, you know, like, oh my gosh, she could die any second. And it's like this emergency plasma phoresis where you run the her blood through the filtration unit. It's a big hairy deal and somewhat dangerous and has side effects, whatever. And it's, and. Uh, so like the whole room is full of people all, you know, everybody's in a hubbub and this poor lady comes to the ER thinking she maybe has the flu and we're like, no, you have leukemia and like it's in terrible crisis and we have to filter your blood right now and if we don't, you could be dead in five minutes and this is, and so they you know, hook all that up and then um, sometimes, as happened for her with plasmapheresis, it's like a, it really screws up your blood. It's especially urgent immersion like that. It just it does wonky things. At least it did back then. So she gets delirious. She's like you know, psychotic. She's hallucinating, I'm thrashing around. You know, tied down to the bed with all this people all still in there, all frantic. And uh, she had she had brought her two kids to the ER with her because she was just thinking, I'm going to, you know, stop by to stop by the maybe I don't know, actually wasn't even the ER. She just came to the clinic, this outpatient clinic. She was going to stop by the clinic like on the way to the grocery store, figuring she's going to be back home, you know, in an hour. So she has her like five-year-old and seven-year-old boys with her. And uh, there was just no plan. I mean, it was... Like this teaching hospital didn't do that particularly well for human care in my assessment anyway. Um, but like in the middle of all this hubbub, there was no plan for them. I mean, the dad didn't even know he was at work somewhere. And these two boys, I, I come out of our team room and I see them. They're sitting outside the door on the floor in the hallway, just staring into space. Mm. Mm. And nobody is like they're just invisible. Mm. Nobody like talked to them. I mean, and, and it went on for like an hour. They're just like, and they hear their mom. And she's thrashing and mm. calling out, and she's delirious, and she's. Mm. Mm. And that was all just a horrible to start with. But like one of the worst parts of the whole memory is I can remember seeing them and feeling like I don't have anything. I mean, not only like I, I'm a 20 something year old clueless, but I, not only did I not even know what to do, but I felt like I don't have anything to give these kids. I'm so tired. Like 
I need to study. I felt like um, if I have any, it was what little T shred of resources I felt like I had. I was like, I don't want to risk my grades. I desperately need to study. I can't, like I'm exhausted. Um, if I if I try to figure out how to take care of these two little guys, I'll get to bed. It'll, you know, I'll have to still do, I mean, your work is all still there. Nobody does any of your work for you. So I would have just gotten to bed that much later. I would have gotten four hours of sleep that night. I was just like, I can feel myself choose to kind of like um, to not to like hold my little bit of resources for myself mm. um, because like I just didn't I, I mean I can make excuses for myself about it was like a horrible brutal situation but at some core level I felt like I could somehow try to help but I don't want to give them, I'm not willing to give them any of my time. I'm mm. too tired. I'm too, I'm afraid I'm going to do poorly in this course because there's no time to study when you're so exhausted. And I just, I just turned, I just turned away. Mm. Mm. Just went back into our, into our team room and worked on charts and just tried not to think about mm. these two little guys sitting down mm. the hallway. Mm. So as you can obviously tell, I'm, I have succeeded in connecting with the painful content from inside the traumatic memory. And now we're going to pretend that we've spent 30 to 40 minutes, you know, trying to, working to resolve the trauma, but without success, and that we're approaching the end of our available time. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe I forgot to get Kleenex again. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Ah, you think after crying any time I ever do this, after th 300 repetitions of it. So again, we're pretending that we've spent 30 to 40 minutes trying to resolve the trauma without success, and now we're running out of our available time. So yeah, back, um, so yeah, I'm just reconnecting with the memory before using the safety net. I can, like the, it's all horrible. The rotation was horrible. The exhaustion was horrible. Um, I can't even remember whether the lady lived. I mean, she didn't die right that afternoon, but I, I can't remember what happened. But seeing these two little guys, and like they weren't crying, they were just still. They were they weren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. They were just staring into space with this kind of miserable, lost, frightened expression on their faces. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I just turned away. Mm. 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 And I, so I, I still don't perceive Jesus' presence with me in the traumatic memory. I, mm. I don't feel like anything we've I don't feel like anything we've been doing in any of our interventions haven't. I don't feel like anything we've done has helped resolve the trauma at all. It still just feels bad. Everything just feels bad still. Well, uh, I'm noticing that we're coming to the end of the time that we have for today. So I think we should deploy the safety net uh, so that we can get the plane back on the ground, as you explained, by the end of the session. So is it okay if I coach you back to your positive memory and the connection with Jesus you had before? Yeah, I, I, I want to come back and work on this. I want to figure out what's in the way so we can get this memory healed. But um, yeah, I'm deaf. I'm, I'm fine being done for today. I'd be happy to, I'm, I'm fine going back to the home base. Okay, good. So, so now try to just choose to imagine yourself being back inside of the memory of canoeing in Minnesota, seeing the river otters come around the corner, and there's the little sea serpent in the water, um, and, and try to go ahead and just describe it as much detail as possible. And 
And then after you've been describing the memory, go back and focus especially on the best parts until you can feel strong appreciation again. Okay, so, yeah, I don't feel it at all at the moment, but I'll talk about it for a while. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, we're on the river. Um, even before we got to the Seattle, we're having fun. We're just crew this, this a calm, a calm, small river, not moving too fast. So it's just silent, and we're just kind of floating along, just that occasional paddle, just so quiet, except for the the breeze and the grass and occasional bird call. Kind of that smell of Minnesota Boundary Waters wilderness. I mean, come around that corner and see the sea otters way up there. And it's just thinking again about, I can remember thinking that, like, oh yeah, the sea otters are curious. Having that thought about, like, let's. Just I, go, Let's, I wonder what would happen if we like started singing. You know that mm -hmm. somehow it just seemed like the kind of thing that would make a sea otter curious. I'm thinking that's so. I explained that to you guys, and, and we're like, okay, and we all start singing. Shine, Jesus, shine, first verse over and over again, or the refrain, or whatever. And they're like, instead of running away, they they poke their heads out of the water, you know, and they're like, oh, what, what's, oh, what's, what's going on, yeah. <laughs> And they're like, whoa, what's this? What's what's this? What's going on here? And we get closer and closer and closer, and we keep thinking, like, wow, I can't believe they're not running away. And then they actually even come toward us, and they're like, again, popping up beside us and in between the two canoes. And like I said, there were a couple times that they were four or five feet away. It was, I mean, you could see their eyes, you could see the little the whiskers on their faces, you know, even their little paws would maybe pop out of the water. I'll be like. Oh, it was so fun and cool and beautiful, and they and they just kept going with us. We, like I said, we we went for maybe a quarter of a mile before they finally decided to go off into the reeds. You could see actually little t tunnels in the grasses where they, from obviously where they had been, where they run around in there, and eventually they decided to go do their otter thing and mm -hmm. catch crayfish or whatever. But for you know, for a long time, they just kept following us, in front of us, on one side and the other, and making their little snuffly noises and watching us and listening to us. And then uh, when we did this for the Emmanuel prayer time, and then even just a few minutes ago, inviting Jesus again, that was a really pretty, that was a powerful part of the whole memory, is sensing Jesus kind of, watching with us, enjoy watching us, having so much fun, enjoying being with us. That was, that was all cool. So you want to do the piece again now where you welcome Jesus to be with you and ask yeah. him to help you make the transition from remembering him to perceiving him as a living, interactive presence and notice whatever comes into your awareness. Yeah, thank you for being there, Lord. I welcome you to be with me in this positive memory place. I do ask you to help me make that transition from remembering your presence with me to experience you, experiencing your living presence, experiencing you as a living interactive presence in this memory with us, in this memory with me. It just feels like, again, just okay. so I have a subtle image of his, his, his face kind of just smiling. Um, He's just happy to be with me now. He's he just enjoying the whole thing, enjoying he's enjoying the river, enjoying the nature, enjoying our friendship. It's such a fun, wonderful friendship with Dan and Em. He's like you know how sometimes we'll see a happy family, or we'll mm -hmm. we'll see people being happy and life giving, and it, it's. Um, 
interestingly enjoyable and satisfying to watch people be happy and life giving together. Mm -hmm. It's like he's watching, he's, he's enjoying how much fun we are having together and how much we're enjoying our friendship as well as the otters and the river and the sunshine. And he's just, he's just having such a good time watching us and being with us and sort of watching us have such a wonderful time. Mm. And yeah, he's just, he enjoys being with us and he loves watching us have a wonderful time together. Mm. And he's kind of enjoying, like, I, I can feel again sort of remembering like when you sit with a friend on a couch and you look at a photo, a photo album and you kind of mm -hmm. remember like, oh yeah, I remember that, wasn't that fun? And oh yeah, remember, wasn't that, that was so amazing. I oh, remember we saw the bear on that trail and, and that's all. Mm -hmm. um, that, just, that feels really good. Feels really good to just perceive his presence and feel him being so glad to be with us. Hmm. Well, so mm -hmm. as you can see there, Charlotte was able to use the safety net to bring me back from a, a very painful place inside a traumatic memory to a safe, positive place back at my safety net home base. And even though we didn't resolve the memory, even though the memory was obviously still totally traumatic and full of pain, uh, she was able to use the safety net to help me get my plane safely back on the ground so that we can finish our prayer time with me being okay. So that's exactly what it looks like to use the safety net. Thank you, sweetheart. Amen. Amen. Again, with these safety nets, lay people can safely facilitate emotional healing work. Beginners can safely learn and practice without one-on-one -on -one supervision and we can safely do emotional healing work in group settings. And remember, this teaching segment was just a seven minute summary of the basic material regarding a manual approach safety nets. See the Big Lion book and the Emanuel Approach website for additional discussion regarding a manual approach safety nets. So let me end with a prayer. Lord, help us to be more and more aware of your wonderful, living, gentle, strong, loving, compassionate, comforting, friendship, Emmanuel presence. And if we get stuck in a bad place, in a traumatic memory, or from some other difficult situation in life, help us find our way back to a safety base where we're reconnected with a positive memory, feeling appreciation, and reconnected with, with you, reconnected with your wonderful, living, gentle, strong, loving, compassionate, comforting, friendship, Emmanuel presence. Amen. Amen. We miss you. We love you. Bless you.